today I'm going to be doing a bit of a video people have been asking about for a while. I'm going to do a little bit of a walk around on the battle wagon here. It's been a while since I've done a good in-depth walk around to show everybody what's up with the machine. And we'll go over a bunch of the parts that are on the machine and what I think of them, how they've been performing, and whether or not I'd recommend them. So stay tuned. This one's not really a ride video, but it'll give you a bit of an in-depth idea of what I take out on the rides. So let's find a nice place to park here and uh, we'll get into the video. I'm just out in the backyard here in the Team AJP compound, just some of my little at-home backyard trails. So today I'm going to do a video that's not really a trail ride, it's more of a in-depth walk around of my machine, the Battle Wagon. A lot of you guys have been asking for a video like this for quite some time, so i finally gotten around, got a few minutes and a little bit of a nice day here to show you around the machine. The snow has melted, it's pretty warm out, so that's always nice. Uh, I live outside the city, I'm in my backyard right now in the uh, Team AJP compound, let's call it, um, just in my backyard trails here where I can mess around a little bit, get a little bit of privacy. No other people to run across here, so I'm out following the rules. You guys know it's this COVID-19 crap going on right now. So um, unfortunately, that's impacting a lot of a lot of things we had planned, all of us. It's impacting all our lives globally. A lot of you guys know I work in frontline healthcare, so that's impacting me pretty significantly as well. And with the situation with all the borders shut down, I've had to cancel a ton of trips I had planned. 2020 was a big year for me. I'd planned a lot of trips. I wanted to meet up with a lot of you guys, the viewers, and really get to know a lot of people and, and, and ride with a lot of people that watch the videos. That's still my goal, but right now we're gonna have to play it by ear. So uh, the trips I had planned in March, April, and most likely May right now are just off the books. Probably not gonna happen. It's not gonna be any traveling going around. But I got a ton of content in the vault that I'm gonna work on editing, getting all caught up. So there's gonna be plenty of trail riding footage coming your way, as well as a few install videos and stuff like that. But we're gonna get started off by showing you about, um, showing you around the Razor and giving you a good idea of the machine that I do take out riding. This is my film rig and my trail machine. So um, I'll give you a good walk around. I'll show you all the parts that are on it. I'll uh, tell you what I think of them. Uh, I'll tell you what I like about them. I'll tell you some downsides to them and my experiences with them. So let's get into it. Obviously you guys know that there is quite a few channel supporters over the years. We've kind of built a following. We've been lucky enough to have some key players on board for quite a while. Big shout out to Royal Distributing. They're our first real supporter followed by Super ATV. Um, Royal Distributing is one of Canada's biggest power sports suppliers and I don't need to tell you who Super ATV is. They're pretty much one of the big boys in the ATV and side-by-side -side market, have been for quite a while. Wicked company to deal with, wicked parts, wicked service, just all around probably one of my favorite companies out there not just because they support the channel I was purchasing a ton of their products before they even reached out to me and wanted to work with us so um, those are the two title sponsors we've had those guys on board for coming around three seasons now speaking of super ATV there's a lot of super ATV goodies on this thing you guys know that first of all one of my favorite modifications on this machine and one I get asked tons of questions about is this exo cage the exoskeleton, the battle cage, whatever you want to call it. This thing is wicked. Super ATV offered this part for sale for quite a while. I don't think it's available for this model anymore, but like a lot of big parts and complex parts like this, they'll make a few batches of them. And then as the models start to change, it's hard for them to keep up with products like this. Um, however, tons of people ask me about it and I know a lot of you guys are bummed out, you can't get it anymore. This cage has sh saved my machine so many times. It's really well built, has a lot of structural rigidity. It winds out the ass a bit here, so I always laugh about saying I got a ghetto booty. But check out all these scratches on here. All that crap there, that would have been my fenders all broken and ripped off. The, the, the wrap on this machine and the body panels on this machine are in such great shape strictly due to this cage. I've had it rolled over on this side I think twice. You can see a little bit of damage here. Once in West Virginia where I picked up a few of these dents on the stock cage. And I also rolled it over in Tennessee, and I've had it over on its side a few other times, but those are the most notable ones. On this side, you can see I've smashed a few rocks under here. Thank you, Tennessee, Widowmaker right there. Anyways, yeah, super solid product. Um, Super ATV still does sell all these bumpers, like this rear bumper here. You can get that through Super ATV, Wicked Bumper. You can get similar uh, Nerf bars, tree kickers, uh, whatever you want to call them on the sides there. 
And they still sell this uh, bumper, I believe. And uh, bumper is similar to this for pretty much most model machines out there. They sell like, there's actually quite a few options from Super ATV. They, all, they usually offer like two or three different bumpers. But this all comes down to personal preference. Anyone you go with really, will, with a solid uh, bumper that mounts really nicely, like this one mounts well to all the stock locations. Uh, I, I recommend you really get a good set of front and rear bumpers. And if you do any sort of trail riding, I totally guarantee you need the tree kickers, the nerf bars, tree bashers, whatever you want to call them there. We got the Super ATV high clearance arched forward facing A-arms. They offer a few different types, models, designs of these. These are their high end chromoly arms with the thread in ball joints. So these ball joints don't press in, they thread in, which is pretty cool if you need to change one on the trail. Uh, and just in general, um, it's a cool idea, cool concept. I've run multiple setups of these Super ATV arms. I've run their regular high clearance arms, just the HD ones, the non chromolies They're always good and strong. The chromoly ones are a little stronger, a little bit more gusseting, stronger material, thicker walls on the tubing. Um, if you're really gonna send it and hit stuff hard, these are the ones, they're worth the extra few bucks. Uh, they also make the Atlas arms, which are like all boxed and super heavy duty, really heavy. If you're like bouncing it, rock crawling, like going real hard, they are much heavier, but you're not breaking those arms. You're going to break whatever they're attached to most likely. Right here, you see my Rhino 2.0 axles from Super ATV. This is going to be coming on the third season I've run these. I've got probably coming around 3,000 miles on these axles. I've only had to replace one of the joints because I tore a boot and um, I drove it through a bunch of mud and stuff like that. Once I took the boot and everything apart and took the joint apart, it actually wasn't damaged at all, but I figured since I was in there, I would replace it. Super ATV sells all the replacement components, boots, joints, everything you need to rebuild those axles, but they also give you a solid warranty. Uh, Super ATV offers Rhinos, Rhino 2.0s. Um, they offer an extra heavy duty option now too. Um, the cool thing about Super ATV is they offer a ton of different products that suit everyone's needs and budget. Uh, so all their products are competitively priced, but they offer products that range in pricing. So they'll offer axles and bumpers and stuff like that in various price ranges for everybody. In the back, I got some more Super ATV goodies here. I got the Super ATV boxed heavy duty radius rods. They also make high clearance versions of these. They make tube high clearance versions. They make, they make um, aluminum ones, I believe. So um, there's a lot of options there. They've changed over the seasons. So there's tons of different rear radius rod setups. They're all heavy duty. They're all really good. These ones are super strong. They're not breaking that. I smashed them off a ton of stuff. I, I kind of wish I had gone with the high clearance ones that kind of bend up like that. But um, these ones probably are a little stronger. You lose a little strength in the bends, but I doubt it would be enough for me to ever notice or need. Rhino 2.0 is in the rear just as well, especially in the rear. If you're gonna, if you're, if you're gonna upgrade axles, especially on a turbo model or a bigger machine and you're hard on it, do the rears. Uh, you break a front, you can still kind of get around, but you break a rear, it's, it's hard. It's hard. You usually end up breaking the next one right away because it's a locked rear end and it just sends all the power to that one axle. So if you're gonna upgrade axles, start with the rears and then work your way to the fronts. Remember, when you upgrade to a heavy duty front axle, you're moving the weakest link. Any modification you do, it's a game. It's always about moving the weakest link. So when you modify something, you gotta remember, you're putting stress somewhere else. Basically, Polaris, oh, people always laugh about Polaris. Oh, their axles snap like toothpicks. Well, you know what? It's a shear pin. It's easy to change an axle. An axle is cheap. And when you, when you make the axle, the shear pin, especially in the front end, it takes a lot of stress off that diff. So basically, the diffs have improved a lot over the years. The turbo, 2017 turbos here, still didn't have the best differential, but I've, had, I've got 4,500 miles, let's say, on mine right now. I just rebuilt it recently and when i rebuilt it it still wasn't destroyed inside it, it was worn but it was it wasn't blown up yet it comes down to how you use it how hard you drive it number one rule when you're driving any of these side by sides if those front wheels leave the ground and you're in four by four take your foot off the gas before those front wheels touch if you're spinning when those front wheels come down with that impact force especially with an aggressive tire generally speaking if you got stock axles you're breaking an axle if you got upgraded axles you're breaking a diff possibly hurting the, the, the drive shaft as well. Um, which brings me to say, um, another issue with these machines, let that truck drive by.
Another common issue with these machines, the razors particularly, is the drive shaft, the main drive shaft, the um, prop shaft, as a lot of people call it, that runs from the front diff to the tranny. It's a long shaft with a hanger bearing over there, uh, right under the shifter area. So those hanger bearings from the factory suck. I recommend replacing them. There's a lot of argument online about how it's better to run a pillowed hanger bearing that's encased in rubber. You know what? I've gotten rid of my rubber mount and gone to a solid mount on this machine. I've been running it since brand new almost. I've never had an issue. The biggest issue is that the stock prop shafts come terribly phased. They're so out of phase when you get them. Some are better, some are worse. A lot of the front end noise and vibration you'll get in these in four wheel drive with the stock drivetrain is due to that prop shaft being improperly balanced and improperly phased in addition to all the slop that you get through that um, rubber kind of encased OEM hanger bearing. For street driving, stuff like that, I understand that, you know, you want that rubber encased bearing because it adds, it quiets it down, it makes it more comfortable, less driveline vibration and noise in street driving conditions. Heavy duty on and off throttle, jump in, bouncing it off stuff, going real hard. I still think the billet hanger bearings are the best. I've been running the Super ATV setup. However, I know Sandcraft RCR makes one too. Um, and I'm running the Sandcraft RCR internals on the front diff. I did a whole install video on how to rebuild your front differential on one of these Polaris machines. So check that out if you need more info. It tells you about all the Sandcraft RCR heavy duty components I put in there to bullet proof my front diff, replaced all the plastic pieces with billet, and upgraded the spray carrier and all that good stuff. The armature plates upgraded. That front diff is as bulletproof as it can be. And as well, I replaced all the OEM worn bearings with SKF heavy duty bearings. So that baby should hold together great. Ever since I did that, that front end has been so quiet. The vibrations are reduced. It's great. It's awesome. Um, if you've got a higher mileage razor and you haven't blown up your front diff or rebuilt it yet, then I highly recommend you get in there, check out those seals. And if your machine's in, in like the three to 4,000 mile range, it's time. It's time, guys. Just tear it apart. Do it yourself. Check out my video. Anyone can do it at home. It's not that hard. If you really need to, you can send your parts away to Sandcraft RCR and they can do it for you, but I really think most of you guys can handle it on your own. Bear with me here. I'm trying to be like as in-depth as I can without being boring. So um, I'm just gonna try and explain every part. Hopefully I don't forget any. Um, so since we've done all those Super ATV components, oh, I'm also running a Super ATV Rhino driveline prop shaft with, um, I'm running their utility series prop shaft. Um, they also make like a bounty series. Anyways, won't get into the specifics. Go on superatv.com, check out their various driveline options from Rhino. Uh, their prop shafts, I believe they offer three versions. They have like a utility, a heavy duty, and like a bounty series. Um, for, for most of you, just so you know right away, if you're going to order a Rhino driveline component, then for 90% of us, you want to go with the utility series. It comes with um, upgraded U-joints, but they're still like a sealed U-joint. Uh, they're non-greasable. You don't have to worry about servicing it every ride. Like if you go out and get the bounty series, that's like their heaviest, strongest one. Yeah, what you don't know is you gotta basically like grease those U-joints after every use, and that gets a little hectic. Well, the obvious thing, it's got a custom wrap. Um, some of the, the sponsor logos you see on there are just stickers over top of the wrap, but the wrap was done by ECD Customs. Eric at ECD Customs used to be located in Northern Ontario in Canada, but uh, I think last year or so he moved to Utah, actually. Uh, he's been in the wrap game for a long time. He's an OG, he's done a lot of race sleds does a lot of these side-by-sides now. Check out the website. Three years on the strap, boys. Three years. And she's holding together mint. Uh, it, people are always blown away by how well the wrap's holding together. Is it scratched in a few spots? Heck yeah, it's scratched in a few spots. Is it peeling off anywhere that, that, that's causing any issues? No, it's not. The only, issue, the only place it's actually peeled is a little bit here, but that's like rock debris territory, and I pressure washed the crap out of that. It's still on there. The other side's mint. Look at that. And like you guys know what kind of conditions this lives in. And if that's still on there, oh, no problem. Got a little tear here, but I think that might be kind of my fault hitting it with a pressure washer too. But that's been like that for ages. It's not peeling more. Yeah, it's awesome. Fin Trail, you guys know I rock the Fin Trail waders. They've been a big supporter of the channel as well. Um, aside from Super ATV and Royal Distributing, those were kind of like our next big sponsor that jumped on board and supported the channel when it was still picking up before it was at the level it's at now. I know a bunch of you guys have probably seen the videos online of people getting things through the firewall of their machine here. It's a plastic firewall. Um, and 
what I'm running here is the McNasty Customs aluminum firewall guards. Um, they are gonna protect anything from going through there. It's nice and thick, they're easy to mount, and they're really cheap, actually. They're a good deal. Check them out, McNasty Customs. Uh, they sent me those um, free of charge. Uh, I've won them for a while. I talked to the boys online, and the owner said, you know, he loves the channel, loves what we're doing, so we wanted to show people what those are capable of, and um, I'm gonna slap together an insult video and stuff like that down the line for those as well, but they look awesome, and they function really well. Uh, aside from looking good, they add safety to the machine. Those plastic firewalls, like they don't stop nothing. There's tons of videos online of, uh, of guys getting hurt or close calls. We've had a few where debris comes through the firewall and like gets jammed in here. There was recently a video, a guy got, um, got a, like a, a log or a stick right through his thigh. Needed like a ton of stitches. Pro armor doors. <laughs> uh, the reason they're not closing well isn't their fault. I, when I rolled the machine on this side, I've also had it open up on in uh, Tennessee. The door opened up when I was doing a climb and it like bent it all back. So I kind of just slammed it back into place. I've never taken the door off and really fixed it properly. Big fan of these Pro Armor Stealth doors though. They're way better than those crappy plastic Polaris ones. Uh, and they add an aggressive style to the to the machine too. FXR is another one of our supporters. They're a Canadian apparel company. They make a ton of cold weather gear as well as lifestyle apparel. They're huge in um, snowmobiling and huge in motocross. Uh, they're a big Canadian brand, but they're international as well. They're all over Europe and in the States. So you'll see a lot of big name moto, moto um, racers wearing FXR, stuff like that. They supply us with a lot of our, our snow suits, um, our nice warm jackets, uh, sweaters, stuff like that, lifestyle apparel. Uh, it's awesome because Royal Distributing is actually the biggest FXR dealer internationally. Um, and I guess like the long story short, the owner of Royal Distributing and the owner of FXR uh, they're good friends because uh, both Canadian companies and they've both been uh, doing really well and growing really large over the last, let's say, 10 plus years. Uh, let's jump over to the tires here. I'm running my 30 by 10 by 14 ITP Blackwater Evolutions. You guys probably know I love these tires. Um, I've had them for quite a while. A bunch of the guys in our group have had them and I'm running them on a beadlock wheel. These are the Fuel Anza beadlocks. I've also run Cam C wheels. Had a little less luck with the Cam C wheels. I've broken a bunch of them. Um, but that's not, I don't know if it's my fault or the wheel's fault, but regardless, um, make sure you get yourself a beadlock. A beadlock's great, especially on the trail. You can run really low air. Even if you get a flat, you don't have to worry about that tire falling off the rim. So you can kind of putt your way out of wherever you need to be. Uh, these ones are beat up pretty good because it's an off-road machine. I don't care. I don't care my wheels are scratched. So yeah. Definitely recommend a beadlock. Definitely recommend running a spare tire uh, on longer trips as well. Shocks, quick touch on those. Uh, last, one of the last mods I really want to do on this machine is I want to get rid of the stock helper spring and I want to go with like an razor aid spring or I mean checking out the razor aid springs. I mean checking out shock therapy. I don't know what I'm going to do yet, but supposedly that's one of the best upgrades you can do for drivability on these machines. Whether you have a 900S, uh, even an X3 from what I've heard, or like a, a Razor Turbo or a, a 1000 XP. Uh, upgrading the springs or just the helper springs is a huge difference, a huge upgrade. I'm running the HMF Titan Quiet Series system. It's the full turbo back with the additionally the improved downpipe. I've had this exhaust on for just under a year and it works great. Um, I've got an install video that I'll be dropping for it real soon. Uh, it's a wicked sounding exhaust. It's not obnoxiously loud and it looks awesome. The fit and finish of this exhaust is next level. Uh, and the quality of the, the material is amazing. Amazing. Uh, everything goes together really nice. Uh, it's just, it's really top quality, nine out of 10. Uh, these guys, like as far as exhaust goes, um, they're, they're in the top of the game there. Uh, totally recommend HMF. Uh, Royal Distributing is actually a big HMF dealer here in Canada or in the States, you can just check them out online. I'm sure there's tons of dealers around all you guys. Obviously just got the quarter windshield or the half windshield or what you want to call it there. I got some light bars on the roof. Got a light bar on the bumper there. The light bars and the lights I'm running are just China special right now from like Amazon and stuff. Got a rear light bar and I got some rear backup lights here too. They're just like, I think my front light bar, it's a 32 inch, it was $32 on eBay. Does it work well? Yeah, for $32 it does. Is it super rugged and reliable? No, you'll get a season out of it. But for 32 bucks, I don't know. But 
with that being said, I am ready to upgrade. I've wanted to upgrade my light bars forever, but really I just kind of been focusing on some other core components before I go and uh, focus on that. However, recently the guys from Baja Designs uh, saw some of the videos and they reached out, so I'm super stoked. I'm hoping I'll be able to work with them. Told them I'm a little busy now and we got that whole COVID crap going on right now. So the goal is to kind of get a few other videos all caught up and I'm gonna touch base with Baja Designs and we're gonna get some of their lights on there. So I'm gonna do a cool video. I'm gonna compare the difference between like this, this budget brand China light and what you actually get from a, a proper uh, LED light manufacturer like Baja Designs who are at the top of the game. Um, I'm really stoked to get some of those lights because it's gonna light up the sky at night. I can't wait to, to, like these give off, don't kid yourself, these give off a lot of light, a lot more than just those headlights, especially for the price, but they leak they don't last long the the light output and the pattern isn't great but like i said you get what you pay for and for a budget they work well they get you out of a bind can't wait to see what those baja design lights are going to be like though i'm hoping to upgrade the headlights and get myself a light bar or two as well um i touched on the mcnasty customs firewall guards out back here i've also got the mcnasty customs rear fender guards it's a aluminum sheet that goes all down there and up in the bed to prevent anything from coming through there, puncturing through the back or through the side of the bed. Also a nice addition. You can get these as a set from McNasty Customs or you can get them individually. Up here I've got, uh, like I was saying, you break a rear axle, you're in trouble. So I got a spare heavy duty rear axle back there uh, on the Super ATV cage mounted axle mounts. Okay, let's work our way into the cockpit now, into the cabin and see what we got. Not too, too much upgrades done in here, but still, this is where you spend your time. Obviously harnesses. I've run the retractable harnesses in the past from Imi. They're the best, they're amazing. However, currently I'm running a GeForce off-road setup. I'm running their uh, off-road suspension seats, their marine grade vinyl, full suspension seat. Uh, the pads and everything comes off, it's easy to clean. They're very comfortable seat. They're a massive improvement over stock. The comfort of these seats is wicked. And when you're riding and actually in cold weather and stuff, they actually do keep you a little warmer. Aside from that, they're a nice big bolster. Uh, they got the side bolsters here. Uh, you really stay planted in these seats. You're not sliding around. Even when your butt's covered in mud and you're wet uh, or it's cold and, and, and you're covered in snow, you're not slipping and sliding around in those seats. These four-point harnesses are comfortable from G-Force. The cool thing about this setup too is it's, it's a little bit on the, the lower end when it comes to pricing in comparison to some of the competition out there. But G-Force is a huge company. G-Force Racing has been around for ages. Um, and this is their, their off-road division, G-Force Off-Road. It's like a sister brand of the main G-Force line. Uh, so yeah, seats have been pretty good so far. I'm pretty happy with them comfort-wise and looks-wise. They're top-notch. Got the G-Force Off-Road weather-resistant bags here too. They're pretty good. Nice storage in the doors. Uh, interior storage on these razors and on all side-by-sides in general is limited. These are great. Uh, they're not submersible, but they are quite water resistant. Um, I wouldn't put anything too sensitive in there. Uh, if it's pouring rain, it's gonna get damp in there. But generally speaking, if you're just getting them splashed and stuff like that, they're gonna keep everything dry. Oh man, gotta love this. Got the Razorback technology infrared belt temp gauge. Wicked upgrade. I think everyone should have this. Everyone needs a belt temperature gauge, especially on a Razor or a Razor Turbo. Especially on a Razor Turbo, guys. Uh, Razor Turbo S on um, on a 1000 XP, even if you ride hard on a Maverick X3 Turbo, for sure you need that belt temp gauge. It lights up from green to orange to red, and uh, it lets you know what's going on with that belt. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of like the temperatures and stuff like that but um, it's all listed on their website and you can find a lot of info online. Maybe if you guys are interested, I can make a video that's more specific to that, letting you know what like danger zones are. Um, but that thing's really helped me kind of get a feel on what's going on with my belt, when I should lay off or when I can keep plowing into that throttle and not worrying about it. Speaking of the belt, um, so here's the infrared belt temperature sensor that's pointed at your belt, gives you a good reading. Um, it's a really easy install and, and there's good instructions. Aside from having that belt temp gauge, I've got a marine grade bilge fan that I put into my um, intake piping here and it's powered on a switch on my dash. It sucks quite a bit of air actually. Like you can feel it sucking air through your hand here. Like it moves quite a bit. I, I think it's like 400 CFM or something. The cool thing is 
when you're crawling slow and stuff like that, it's pulling in a lot of air because how much air gets pulled into the CVT has a lot to do with your RPM and how fast those clutches are spinning. Or when you stop and you're really hot, that thing keeps air flowing through your tranny and you can really see it on the belt temp gauge. You can see the temperatures dropping uh, when this is on versus when it's not, especially at idle. Um, and even at higher PM, there's people saying, oh, you know, the, it adds restriction. I haven't had any issues with that adding restriction. Uh, the belt temp gauge lets me know what's going on. Uh, there's other mods you can do too. Some people put like an additional hole in there and mount like an, ad uh, an additional tube that blows air in there. I haven't really needed it. The only times where I really start running real hot is when I'm wide open, high load scenario, going up a hill, uh, West Virginia or Tennessee or something, and really pushing it and like foot to the floor buried for an extended period of time. Um, I haven't had many belt issues and I haven't had a critical belt failure since I ran that uh, belt temp gauge and did this. My belt life has doubled. Um, I'm also running the Evolution Power Sports badass belt. It's been the best belt I've run so far. From my understanding, Trinity Racing and, um, and Aftermarket Assassins uh, run a sim similar G-Boost belt. Belt is made by G-Boost, so um, from my understanding, they're all the same belts, just branded differently. So G-Boost belt. Um, I've, uh, I've been running the Evo Power Sports one. Um, I've got another one in my gear pack as a backup. And then I also, I'd say this belt's probably the best followed by OEM. Uh, I still got my rear sway bar hooked up. Um, a lot of people ask me about the blow off valve. Um, actually, they're like, oh, you know, can you, uh, can you run a blow off valve when, when you're mudding and getting real dirty? The truth is the, the, the blow off valve runs on a closed loop design. It's actually more of a diverter valve setup. Um, so it, re, it recirculates the air in the system back into a closed intake system like back into the intake tubing so um the factory valve or if you just replace the factory valve with an aftermarket valve like an improved one for reliability and you you run all the piping from the factory you can submerse it it's not an issue however when you open up the valve to give you that whoosh, that whoosh you know the bov sound then generally it becomes an open loop system and if you submerse it, you will backflow water or debris into your intake tract and destroy your engine potentially. So I don't have a boost gauge yet. That's another cool mod I want to do, but let's fire it up. So opening the valve up to the atmosphere gives you this kind of a sound. hear that in a lot of the videos uh, a lot of you guys love it some of you guys think it's annoying well get over it because you got a turbo you got to have a bov to me it's just like i love turbos i've got them on a bunch of vehicles i've always been in the boost game um <laughs> a turbocharged vehicle without a bov to me it's just like something's missing when i let off that throttle i want to hear that whoosh sound so uh, basically what you're hearing there is you're hearing an open loop system i've got mine set up kind of custom so uh what's happening is instead of the intake air that's coming out of the charge uh, system like the, the the intake tubing is charged it's pressurized it's boosted right to a certain amount of air when you let off the throttle it doesn't need all that boost so it has to release it instead of releasing it into the tubing where you don't really hear much of it into the closed system when you do an atmospheric uh, blow off valve that releases into the atmosphere not back into the intake track you get that whoosh sound so I've got mine set up where originally it would mount to like the intake tube there you can see it i've got it capped off i don't know how well you can see that but it's capped off and then um usually to have a tube running there to the bov i've capped that off and i got a tube running from my bov outlet through this heavy duty gates uh tubing here similar to like a heater hose it's braided it's high temperature hose and it's running up to my bed here and into this little like air filter box off a lawnmower actually that I jimmy rigged up there to fit. And that's where the line comes out up here. I've got it routed up to where my air intake for my CVT and my engine are on the other side. So I know if I'm submersing up to here, I've got bigger issues. So I never go that deep. You know, guys, I'm not a mutter. I usually go around stuff that deep. So as long as I stay around here with my water, it's not gonna contaminate my blow off valve. Not to mention the fact that there's a lot of piping in there and a, and a bend down here. So even if I were to get a little, like, like a little bit of water in there, it's actually going to just probably end up blowing it out. Uh, it, it won't damage anything. So um, 
that's where I get that whoosh sound. That's why you can hear it so well in the videos because all the noise comes out of here basically. Uh, usually if you just vent them to the atmosphere and uh, you don't have like the recirculation tubing like I do, you can see the blow off valve there. I'm running a Rev1 from Super ATV, full aluminum uh, blow off valve. Um, usually there'd be just like a little tube and a filter right there and that's where the whoosh noise would come out of. Uh, you can see how like that's low down there so you get it contaminated in that area. That's why I've moved mine up to there. So uh, I've actually filmed a video of like how I did that. So if you guys want more details, I get asked that question a ton in the video comments. So I'm actually probably gonna slap together a quick video to show you guys how I've routed it in more detail. So you can see that's the turbocharger right there. You've got the inlet pipe and then you got the, the, the pot pipe from the, um, or so you got the inlet pipe from the uh, air box going into the turbo, getting compressed and coming out the charge tube here. And then we got the, the diverter valve, or the blow off valve right there. So yeah, you see that red tube there? It loops around the bottom, comes back out here, keeps everything nice and safe, keeps the elements out. What else we got in the interior here? Well, we got our RAM mounts. I got my phone mount. I keep a phone in there sometimes, or I'll keep my point and shoot camera at handy there in case I want to get a quick shot. Um, and then I've got my tablet mount here. Uh, and on that tablet mount, I can run my GPS setup. So my go-to GPS when I'm riding in the States is obviously the Lifetime Trail Maps, boys. You need the best system out there. So the LifetimeTrailMaps.com, head on over there and get yourself this GPS setup. Everyone that works at Lifetime Trail Maps rides. Uh, we've ridden with the owner in, in a few of the videos actually from Tennessee. And uh, recently we we're gonna hook up with them again and do some more riding, but yeah, our trip got canceled, unfortunately. Anyways, a um, bit of a plug for Lifetime Trail Maps, probably the best GPS trail system out there. It, it actually blows Polaris Ride Command out of the water. All you need to run it is a Samsung device, uh, an, a Samsung tablet or a Samsung phone. And the reasoning behind that is Samsung has the best GPS chip in their equipment or in their hardware, uh, so you can't run it off an iPhone or something like that. But uh, Lifetime Trail Map sells full kits with the tablet already, or you can just buy the software um, and then install it on your tablet, which is what I did. Uh, what else we got here? We got a winch, obviously. Got a 4,500 pounder. I got a 4,500 pound um, Super ATV Black Ops winch it's the second one i've run on this machine got two years out of my first one was still working but was starting to get tired so uh, i got another one through super atv the boys there sent me one uh saying that <laughs> uh, they know i'm gonna put it to good use so um yeah winch definitely need a winch you can't go out riding without a winch guys like it it always blows my mind when i see people stuck on the trail and they're like pinned in somewhere they could get out of themselves in five minutes and they don't have a winch Another critical mod I always talk about in the videos you guys know is the skid plates. I'm running a full aluminum skid plate setup from Rival. Rival Power Sports make this, makes this skid. It's its third season I've had it on. Three seasons on this skid and it's still solid. It's got some battle scars and some wounds and stuff like that, but no damage to the point where like it would impact its, its use. It has saved my machine so many times. The amount of hits it's taken. You can't ride hard, you can't ride rocky terrain, uh, or, or, or like out in the bush, in, in, in the forest, or going over logs and stuff like that without an upgraded skid plate. Now, with that being said, it seems that these days, you can see the skid comes out here too. These days, um, it seems that UHMW is becoming the preferred material ultra high molecular weight like plastics um, versus the aluminum but generally speaking you can get an aluminum skid plate that's just as strong for a little bit less than UHMW. Is UHMW a better material? Short answer, yeah it is. It slides over obstacles better, it's quieter and it's as slick as ice so it doesn't get hung up like sometimes an aluminum plate if you dent it a bit and it jams into a rock you can actually it can slow you down it can kind of there's friction UHMW you don't get that you just slide right over it I'm trying to see did I forget anything here uh, I don't want to leave anyone out what else so obviously aside from these uh, aside from these tires that I've got here you guys know I uh, I've, you've probably seen other tires on my machines um, I've also got a set of Braven berserkers for like my more of my street hard pack tire I've run various other tires you know I'm a big fan of dirt commanders too 
Um, I like those tires. Uh, a lot of guys are running the Maxxis Carnivores now with really good results, and Super ATV Warriors are really good tires for terrain like West Virginia and Tennessee from what I hear and what I've seen. If you're looking to mount anything in your machines, um, like doesn't matter what it is, then I totally recommend like the Ram mount, Ram style, the Ram mount ball mounts. Uh, you can mount these anywhere, they're quite universal. Uh, you'll see a lot of like military applications around these city buses, uh, ambulances. They all run these ram style mounts. Uh, it's like their patented ball design. They're wicked. They're super sturdy. They're strong. I run one up here for my main front facing camera too that I get a lot of the shots with. They're just wicked mounts. So uh, they're expensive. I'm not going to lie. They're pricey. But you get what you pay for. They're not going to break. They're made out of good quality components. I don't know if I mentioned uh, the infrared bell temperature gauge here that I'm rocking. It's made by Razorback Technology. Wicked American company, check them out online. I'm gonna touch quickly on the wheel bearings. Uh, wheel bearings are a hot topic in the side-by-side -side world and in the Polaris world. We get our chops busted by the other brands. Sometimes they're like, oh yeah, you can't keep a wheel bearing in a Razor. You can't. You gotta grease it with a wheel bearing greaser and good quality grease, and you gotta run an OEM bearing. I believe uh, recently in the last year or so, Polaris has come up with an updated bearing design that runs like a, plas uh, a metal ceiling ring instead of like a plastic one, and it's a slightly upgraded bearing design. People have been having a lot better luck with those. Stay the heck away from aftermarket bearings, stuff you see on Amazon, China bearings, basically like that. Uh, like the, um, you wanna stay away from like the, I've had a really bad luck with all balls. Uh, not the brand bash, but it's true, their bearings suck. Uh, their product quality has really gone down over the years, I find. Um, so I think the key is to stick to an OEM bearing. Yes, the OEM bearings are manufactured in China, but obviously they're doing something a little bit better or it has slightly better specification. Uh, SKF doesn't make a replacement bearing, unfortunately, for these applications. So you're kind of stuck with that OEM bearing. But as long as you get the OEM bearing, you put it in properly, you grease it from the get-go properly, you grease it at least every oil change or more frequently if you ride in a lot of wet conditions. And um, also make sure when you're putting that wheel bearing uh, or that axle nut on, make sure you got uh, a good strong thick washer that's not going to cave in or double washers and you torque that wheel bearing and the, and the hub assembly to spec. It has to be torqued properly. So the torquing procedure impacts bearing life. You need to torque it to what they specify because the load of that pressure is what pulls the bearing together and gets those tolerances to where they need to be. If it's too loose or too tight, it's gonna impact bearing life. So let's talk about air filters. You should be running an OEM air filter, running a paper cord filter. Don't be running KNNs. Just look online, look at the horror stories of running KNNs in dirty conditions. There's one way KNN makes airflow at the sacrifice of filtration. And the moment you put a pre-filter bag on that KNN, you're basically dropping its flow rate to what an OEM filter is anyways. Nothing filters better than the OEM paper design. If you're running a newer Razor 1000 or a Razor Turbo, you've got the Donaldson canister style filter in there. Players offers two filter replacements. They offer a budget like paper one that's white, and then they offer the upgraded, like the upgraded heavy duty or high performance filter, which has a blue, filter core material in it that's the one you want spend the extra few bucks get that have an extra one on hand and uh, the truth is if you're riding really dusty conditions or really wet conditions you gotta be checking that filter often if you're riding in a lot of snow check that filter often you don't want stuff getting in there getting soaked and and then running it when it's wet and stuff like that when it's dry and it's dusty okay you might cut down on your uh, your airflow a little bit but the filter won't let anything go by those Donaldson style air filters it's the best filtration on the market out of the box basically so just stick to it get yourself the the OEM high quality replacement filter um, the, for the 1000 and the um, turbo, I believe it's the same filter element. So make sure you're running that blue cord filter uh, and just check it regularly and, um, and keep that area clean. It's also a good idea to put a little bit of grease around the air box lid, just as an extra little bit of added protection. And then when you're cleaning out the filter, always make sure you clean that air box so it's nice and clean inside. And then next time you pop it off, if there's any mud or any debris or dirt in there, you know that got in there from between the last time you checked it. So that way you're like, oh, okay, maybe I got a, maybe I got a leak in my air box or, or, oh, I know where that came from. I got submerged or like something bad happened. But you know what? It's a good way to figure out what's going on because that's like, you don't want contamination getting into your engine. So just, I can't stress enough. Keep a good, good eye on that stuff. 
fluids, high quality fluids. A lot of people say don't run the Polaris fluids, but if you're under warranty, I suggest that you purchase your fluids from your local dealership to A, support your local dealer, and B, for them to have a track record on the computer that you're regularly purchasing fluids. So when your engine pops for some bad reason, or if it does, you know, there's lemons around. That way, at least, um, they can't come back to you and say, you've never purchased oil. You can't prove us, you don't have receipts for your oil purchases, but you've got 3,000 miles on your machine. Well, this way, Polaris marks how frequently you're buying there. Um, every time your machine goes in for warranty work, they write down all that info. So I make sure that at least every five or six months, if I'm not riding a lot, I go purchase an oil change kit just so it's on the system there and they know that I'm maintaining those fluids, change them frequently. Um, when you're changing the oil, it's also a good idea to change the front diff every time you change the oil, if not more frequently. There's not much fluid in there. It's really easy to change. Um, you buy one bottle of demand drive and it lasts you four or five or more changes. There's like 220 mils in there or something like that. Um, and it's really easy to do. And then your, your, your rear diff and your tranny, you should probably be changing it every two to three oil changes. Also super easy to do and not overly expensive. Uh, grease your, your, your joints in your uh, prop shaft regularly. Uh, like I said, if you're upgrading your prop shaft hanger bearing to a billet style one from like Super ATV, make sure you grease that bearing too. Um, it's all about preventative maintenance on these guys. I hear so many people saying, oh, you know, these machines aren't reliable or they break down. No, they're only as reliable as you make them. If you beat the crap out of it and you park it wet and you don't maintain it, yeah, where's it gonna break? It's gonna break on the trail. But if you take it back home every night after a ride and you clean it and you inspect everything and you see something's a little loose and you replace it then, then it's a whole lot better than replacing that loose component when it shears off on the trail and takes everything attached to it with it. Um, the reason a lot of people complain about how expensive these are, a lot of the damage is collateral damage. If you maintain it, then you're going to be fine. I haven't had any catastrophic issues with this thing. You know, I've broken an axle, I've, 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 I've blown up some belts, I, I've caused some other damage because I've been silly. But generally speaking, all three racers I've had have been very reliable and have never left me stranded on the trail to the point where I can't get back. So um, whether you drive a Polaris, a Can-Am, an Articat, it all comes, it, even your car, your pickup, whatever, it comes down to preventative maintenance and how well you maintain something. If you take care of your stuff, it'll last. And that also, that also bounces back to the quality of parts you use. You got a 20, 30, $40,000 machine, are you gonna go out and try and save $6 on, on wheel bearings? Oh, I could, get a, I could get an OEM wheel bearing for $50 or I can buy a crappy one for 30. Okay, factor in the time it takes to do it all, the, the, the effort involved in maintaining and replacing all that stuff, and then also the risks associated with that failing on the trail and leaving you stranded. I'd say it's worth the extra $100 to just do it right. So keep that in mind when you're, maintain, when you're maintaining these vehicles. When your $30 light bar from eBay fails, it's not the end of the world. When your $30 wheel bearing fails and your wheel falls off, mm. it might not be the end of the world, but there's gonna be collateral, there's gonna be stress, you might not be able to get your machine out that night, or if your wheel fair, bearing fails and grenades and destroys the hub or something in the middle of a high speed corner, you can, you can roll that thing over end over end, and when that happens, you don't know what the collateral is gonna be. It could be, it could be your body, it could be your health, it could be your life. Which leads me to my last plug. Wear your safety gear, guys. Wear your harnesses at all times. Always wear a seatbelt, always wear a helmet. Uh, it's just a little bit of protection. Even if your state says you shouldn't, you don't need to wear a helmet, slap a helmet on, just, open, just an open face. Because when your head hits this, when you're rolling and this caves in and your head smacks it, you're gonna lose. A helmet's gonna save your life, especially when you got two people in. When both your heads hit in the middle of a roll, you, your skulls aren't designed to, to take that kind of an impact, but helmets are. So um, that's just my little bit of a plug on safety gear, guys. Wear it. We're out there to have fun, not hurt ourselves. Uh, you know what, you roll your machine down a hill and it's a KO, that's fine, but I, you know what, I'd rather you get out and walk out a little beaten up rather than me having to wait for an airlift because you're going, to, you're going straight to surgery and you got brain damage or some stupid crap like that. Anyways, um, yeah, I think that's everything. Future upgrades, like I said, I want to do some tender springs on this baby. I want to get an upgraded aftermarket cage. I'd really like to do that uh, for, for looks and for safety. Um, this thing's had a few hits, so I know its structural integrity is probably a little bit impacted. 
Um, obviously, if I get an aftermarket cage, I'm gonna I'm gonna get an aftermarket roof. I'm gonna upgrade these light bars and the lighting to um, a higher quality lighting, like I said. I've got a set of rock lights for this baby as well. I'm gonna put some red rock lights on it, and um, I want to get a boost gauge and just a few other, you know, hop up some some upgraded switches for the interior and stuff like that. Um, I'd like to figure out a way to um, get my retractable harnesses back in but I can't fit them through the holes in these current seats, so I'm gonna have to see if I can come up with some sort of an idea to make that work. Uh, anything else I'm thinking here? I wanna do a bigger tire. I wanna go from a 30 to a 32 inch. I'm thinking of going with a similar tire style to this. I'm really liking the Super ATV Warrior tires, so I might, uh, I might call the guys up at Super ATV, see if I can get my hands on a set of 32s. Um, I'd also consider a set of 32 inch um, ITP Blackwater Evos like this or a set of 32 inch uh, GBC Dirt Commanders maybe but I really do have my I, I, I don't know what I want to do yet see I need a tire that's this aggressive or a little bit more aggressive for a mixed trail use in conditions like now where it's a little wet and then I need more of a hard pack tire like a, a warrior let's say would be great for um, like a Super ATV Warrior tire would be great for like Tennessee, West Virginia, uh, doing a little bit of hard pack riding, some road cruising maybe. And then if I could get a tire that's maybe a little bit more aggressive than this, maybe even like a Super ATV Intimidator or something like that, that'd be a great 32 inch tire for doing like this type of wet terrain we got right here, spring, fall, stuff like that, a bit more mud if I go down south. So um, the truth is having two sets of tires is awesome because uh, it gives you the option. You can't do it all with one tire, but uh, two, usually you can find a happy medium between the two. Anyways, I don't want to bore you guys anymore. I hope you enjoyed the video. I just wanted to give you a bit of an idea, more in-depth input on how this machine is set up. Um, so with that being said, uh, if you don't already subscribe to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. Check out some of the other videos if you haven't done so already. Make sure you check out some of the sponsors I mentioned here and the channel supporters because they make a lot of these videos possible. Also, um, check out our Instagram and our Facebook. Uh, if you don't follow us on uh, Instagram, then make sure you hit that follow button and uh, like us on Facebook. Smash that like button on the videos, guys. Get out there and ride, ride safe, and uh, we'll see you in the next video. And if you're in uh, self-quarantine right now or isolated, doing your social distancing stuff for uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, then uh, I wish you guys luck. Stay safe out there, take care of yourselves, look after your families. And uh, hopefully this stuff can blow over in the next little while so we can get back to riding. I'll keep you all posted on social media as to any rides we plan. The goal is to get out there and ride with as many of you guys as possible in the months to come. My goal has always been to meet more people, build the community around the channel. Thank you so much for the support you guys show me. Uh, the channel's almost at 50,000 subs, which to me is a huge milestone. Once we hit that, the next, the next bracket's gonna be 100K and getting that YouTube logo sent to my house, right? Uh, it's gonna be a while before we hit 100K though. It's, uh, it's not about the numbers though, guys. It's about having fun, enjoying it, and um, yeah, that's it. See you in the next video.